You do this thing. Uh, hello to everybody. So, who is present and who are watching us now? And uh, today, this is the six laser talk in Brussels. And uh, we uh, will have the subject tangible sound post digital instruments audiovisualization technology and extended reality. A few words about what it is, laser talk. Uh, this is the Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous. This is a program of international gathering that brings artists, scientists, humanists and technologists together for informal presentation, performances and conversations. the cultural environment of the region by fostering interdisciplinary dialogue and opportunity for community building. Today uh, uh, we will discuss materialization of digital matter into sound objects, embodied music interactions, specialization technology to enable and investigate synchronization between musical players and uh, using movement and sound, the physical aspects of musical human machine interaction, the interpretation of the physical value of the well established culture, technique, great and tangible user interfaces. We have three panelists here who is with us uh, on uh, air, and uh, I would like uh, to start to introduce you. So, this is Claire Williams. She is an artist and she is working at the board of science, technology, arts and textile. She sees herself as an artist and researcher and that tries to work between these fields, finding a common language, creating and amplifying specific interaction between different mediums. Her obsessions lays mostly around data, sound and ancient textiles, trying to materialize digital matter uh, imperceptibility, imperceptible and inaudible information found in our super saturated techno environment. She likes to work with the unstable media, researching ways to create specific tools, uh, usages, or techniques, techniques to give us a sensitive experience of our daily environment. In her work, she mainly uses textile technique hacked machine, do it yourself, electronics, open source software and hardware. Uh, she uh, she um, graduated with a master degree in textile design from NSAF Belcambo and from Frisnoa National Studio of Contemporary Art. Another speaker that is with us Sorry, I'm always uh, not. This is Paolo van Kerbroek. <laughs> He's a researcher in the field of embodied musical interaction, extended reality, and human computer interaction. He works with extended reality and audio specialization technology to enable and investigate the dynamical processes underlying coordination between musical players. For this purpose, he develops enriched and uh, enriched and mediated musical contest in which people and machines interact and may and can meaningfully express themselves. He obtained a master's in engineering and computer music of the Bonn University and Sorbonne University. Did a research internship in Ocam and worked at the analyst for IBM and European Space Agency. He is currently finalizing his PhD at the Institute of Psychoacoustics and Electronic Music, APEM. His work has been published in the Frontiers and Computer Human Interaction journals and has been represented by uh, ISM. Air, ISMC, and expanded animation at Electronic Con. And our last speaker, last and the first speaker, 
Yes, we started with this uh, laser talk uh, with um, Brigitte Mars and uh, uh, he is a sound artist and postdoc researcher who dedicates his time to find a new ways of expression and play with sound, art and technology. His work explores the intersection between sound art, computer music, locative media and human-machine interaction. As an individual artist, Thomas' activity is centered around ultra noise point ES and focuses on performances and installation with extreme and immersive sounds and environments. He has exhibited and performed in the spaces of Asa Electronica, Sonar, Aircam, Kumo and many, many more, and in galleries and institutions throughout Europe and Latin America, Thumb Lab, the Thumb Lab, Tangible Music Lab at the University of Linz. Uh, Dr. Enrique Tomas, postdoc research is at Thumb Lab. Uh, he has also already his PhD, and after maybe he will tell us few words about it. So, and uh, uh, maybe I would like to uh, start with your presentation so that you can give us some view of your work. Presentation, obviously, prepare. And I announce I have 58 slides. <laughs> <laughs> so see you tonight now. <laughs> so I'm, I'm okay uh, summarizing things. Thanks for the invitation, Alexandra, and thanks so, also to, to Imal for inviting me to, to perform two days ago. So I think it was a, a great. Um, so to say, a uh, connection of events, and I'm really happy to be here. So my, my talk is going to be around tangible music and how I understand it, and, uh, and, and before defining themes, I would like to, to play a video um, about a work I presented two days ago, and maybe also for, for understanding very well what is the, the type of things I'm, I'm doing, and uh, later we can go with the blah blah blah, okay? Thank <laughs> you. 
but now you know a little bit better what I'm doing. Uh, let's go to, to talk about things. Well, uh, I'm obviously uh, an artist working with, with digital media, so digital uh, interfaces. I want to, to present it a little bit just, you know, to, to I don't know, uh, if you're an, an expert on what a digital interface is, maybe we can talk a little bit about it. What I have chosen musical interfaces as my, my, my place to, to, to locate my art is because, well, it's a, it's a strange field. It's an awkward field. It's, it's just you think that it's a place where you can do anything, but actually not. On the one hand, you have the thing of interacting with the machine and understanding what happens in the machine, but actually what happens is this, you know, that it's a, well, it's a cultural event surrounded by people where unexpected things happen and also it's not that, I don't know, <laughs> neutral, but it becomes a kind of, like Manovich said, you know, it becomes a, a hybrid, strange, of, often of word mix of, you know, between the conventions of what the academic informatics are, but also what we are doing with, with electric guitars, maybe. You know? So this is, this is a, a postdoc, a, a dog researcher at my lab, and the simply is like that. She's a Chinese, living in Cologne, everything quite mixed. And these are students of mine, for example, when they finish uh, you know, one course in the, I don't know, it's, it's not what we expect about uh, playing music sometimes. So the thing is that all these kind of medium becomes uh, uh, really problematic. So that at the end, uh, those contrasts between culture, between informatics, between uh, technology, art, science, creates a kind of aesthetic field for us to, to develop our career where we can be really critical with the things others are doing or have done or, and, and, and think about what could be music in, in, in a more tangible and embodied way. So the second part of, of this uh, kind of work is notation. Notation is uh, the, the art of, well, inscribing, engraving music. And if you think about it, it's a way of thinking about music, but on the paper or on, the, you know, on a system which allows you projecting your intentions, musical intentions. If we are going really philosophical, we can say that, yeah, the system defines what you can do with music, etc., etc. I'm not going to enter into that. But basically, the question for me is like, can we see digital interfaces, musical interfaces, as also objects of notation? Because as we have seen, uh, well, all interfaces, all these uh, systems that we use, computers, etc., they have also a representational part, right? That is, well, uh, the functional part is uh, how the, the, the system works. No? It tells us you know, where the cursor is in the, in the screen. But also there is a, a kind of notation, inherent notation in the system, which actually we as artists, we are defining, configuring, shaping all the time for making our works. So at the end, it's not so easy to separate um, what is the work from, you know, it's programming the whole system. And this is why I see that there is an intimate connection between, well, uh, the work and finally the notation, the instrument and also the work. So what can be represented here? Obviously here we are representing notes, no? like triggering notes, for example, and then changing parameters, etc. But where, where does this come from actually? Well, from machines like that, and from machines like that, notes were there, faders was also there, but they were analog, and obviously all these machines are inspired by others. But then there's the next question is, okay, what can be represented here, right? What kind of, of music can be represented here? There are here some aspects of music which are really, really engraved in the object, right? Or, or what can be actually represented in, in that? So, well, this brought me philosophically in my work, in my research, to ask me what's the role of representation and notation in what we are doing. And I got quite inspired by the work of well, William Forsyth. Uh, the choreographer actually has a series of, of works called choreographic objects, in which he's setting up a choreography in an environment. So he's not telling the people what to dance, he just puts space with affordances, with things to do, limiting your movements, but also making you move in another way. So the people are entering these spaces, or these spaces, these, right, pendulums, 
or this whitey, bouncy uh, castle, which is quite famous. And then the choreography is actually inherent in the objects he creates. So he's not writing a choreography, but it's in the object, right? And this also is not a, an, a, it's an old idea. I, I think that, for example, we should be more and more inspired by people like Apollinaire and Mallarmé, right? And when, when he turns things, you know, around and, and back from, from the idea of, of, of reading the system, but he, he's looking here at the performance of, of, of Louis and then says, okay, there is no, not really a, a choreography to read here for the dancer. The dancer is, is basically disengaged from, from writing, but he's creating a kind of poem that is um, with, with, with her movements, right? Where is this poem actually? In the, in the body of the artist, in the system itself? And then coming back to today, this is the situation we have. This is our instruments today, right? Or we can go hardcore and you know explore all the parameters coming here. So basically, we're in a situation in which human-computer interaction, all this field of programming for music, is saturated with representations. So on the one hand, we want to be super and badly free, but we are just connected to this symbolic, symbolic, and many people have said hermeneutic, than actually an extension of the body, right? That we are when playing music, we are not really extending a. a a body that we are using in our so to say, language more than our body. So there is a kind of tension between how much we are embodied or how much we become in hermeneutic. Uh, we are using for symbols or we are actually uh, using you know, a kind of uh, relationship with materials which allow us exploring it in, you know, in a more, uh, in a less symbolic way, I think. So what I, I did is actually having these, these tensions uh, clear, it was, you know, making things like that. So, what is the notation of an object like that, you know? Because actually, we, as humans, we begin seeing symbols everywhere, right? It's, it's really strange, but if we want to see this as a, as a score, it's actually a score, why not? And then I began to, to make uh, well, uh, uh, graphic designs like that, and transforming them into objects, or those ones, this one, right? Uh, or that one. Right. So I started to explore materiality of, of things and engraving my ideas with them and bringing them to an instrument. That is basically what we used in the video at the beginning. Uh, these surfaces are engraved with a musical intention. So these, or those profiles that you saw and patterns and actually, work as a notation, right? Graphic notation, but they also work as a tactile notation. When you are touching them, you are feeling the nuances of what you are playing. What I do in my in my work is analyzing the, the micro noises that you're doing, and with a mathematical uh, um, way or system to classify the sounds, uh, I'm resynthesizing. The, the sound, the, 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 the final sound that you hear uh, with a machine learning algorithm. The idea is that every time you're making a gesture, you're making some, some noise, you make a profile of some mathematical descriptor. And the system is able to synthesize those, finding sounds in a database, in, in the computer, which actually fit better at every moment with what you are doing. So if you play something like, really in the paper, then the computer finds grains of sound making those uh, profiles as well, right. but with all the sonorities. Okay. So I continued doing series of objects like that, like that with some materials, like linear, the one dimensional to explore things like that, or three dimensional, things that like you know, handheld objects, etc., etc exploring different uh, configurations. And all these objects are instruments, but also the notation of what I'm, of what I'm playing. And this is uh, actually the patterns that you saw in, um, in the, in the video I presented at the beginning, etc. Et 
etc. But what I am I'm now finishing, so what I was quite interested to, to look at, and this is a kind of provocation and a big message that I want to throw in this, in this talk, that I, I've been taking a look at a lot at how people touch in this course. Right? These ones, oh, right? if you see these fingers, are different than those fingers, or like those fingers. Right? And then this made me ask myself, why do people approach things in different ways, right? <laughs> that I mean. Where is this, this kind of, I don't know, um, where is the education the, and the filters that we get to, to, to approach an object when we, we can use them? Because every day, now, nowadays, we are just with the mobile phone, with the tip of your finger, and we are, our brain is kind of, you know, we are just touching with our brain, with one finger, everything, right? But what happens when you allow people that's in all the work and just you know, really um, go deep into that. And this is the, the conclusion of what I wanted to bring to this, to this um, uh, conversation. That myself, I'm, I'm a sound artist, programming a lot. I have a degree in engineering as well, and, and doing a lot of things with computers every day. But I think that the, the, the way to escape from this um, paradigm of you know, filtering the things we are doing with, with our bodies is basically coming from, from, from the filters that we impose. So the body is actually, like I say here, it's not, a, a, it's not my idea, it's, it's Hitler. It's the body is the locus that plays upon which the various technologies that uh, our character, where our culture is connected, and they inscribe uh, themselves. So basically, taking more into account the noisiness of our fingers, the, the, the possibilities for contingency that our bodies uh, are bringing, directly, directly we can add an escape from these impossibilities that we have when programming a system. But at the end, we are using symbols, we are using a computer, uh, we know, with all the limitations of uh, actual uh, informatics. But let's put the body in the middle, right, and see what happens. And the second is the acknowledgement that we have to, to bring that, well, culture is a kind of the regime that bodies are passing through. No? This can be taken from different political, aesthetic perspectives, but finally we are domesticating kind of an animal. No? And then when I see different people touching, I also see what kind of person could be, no? <laughs> how it relates to, to the things that, you know, how much that person is studying all things and how mm, 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 what kind of relationship has with the world. Right? So well this is a little bit the, the provocation that I wanted to bring. We have the field of human and computer interaction that I am quite embedded into. But let's put the body in the middle and then let's see uh, how well these domestications that we are doing we can escape from that. Right? So thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. <laughs> so um, now I would like uh, that we will do a presentation that uh, uh, Claire prepared for us. So just to do I'll do a presentation focused more on, uh, on my installations, but uh, generally my work um, consists of, tr of uh, trying to uh, sense or um, naturalize the electromagnetic activity that is in our environments. It goes through different types of spectrum. 
bodies, every day. Uh, radio waves, these uh, cosmic waves, these uh, voicemail, uh, uh, telephone, GSM waves, and and so yeah, most of my work is uh, in trying to build sometimes very art artisanal and very uh, DIY instruments to sense them, like antennas, or uh, sometimes we'll collaborate with uh, bigger antennas like uh, like the Royal Observatory of Belgium, where I will use radioscopes. So uh, every project is. Trying to set up and making it cool. So it's a one project. So I'll show a video, and it says already a lot, but I can go more in depth. s'appelle Zorias. J'avais un peu l'envie de créer une sorte de matière énergie. Donc je me suis inspirée pour cela des phénomènes météorologiques qu'on peut trouver sur Terre, donc comme les aurores boréales et les éclairs. Et euh, ces éléments avaient en commun euh, le fait que ce soit tous des matières qui soient en état plasma, qui est le quatrième état de la matière. Le défi un peu c'était d'imaginer de, de, de créer un, une sorte d'observatoire poétique où on pourrait regarder euh, et interagir avec cette matière énergie depuis la Terre parce que le plasma ne peut pas euh, physiquement avoir lieu sur Terre à cause des différentes pressions atmosphériques. Je suis partie de là, d'inspiration de machines du 19e, où euh, on, on pouvait créer un état plasma euh, en euh, créant des, des environnements scellés. J'ai donc ici travaillé avec du verre, où on a euh, inséré différents gaz nobles. Ces gaz vont de l'hélium, du néon, du krypton, de l'argon. Et euh, ces gaz nobles, qui sont normalement invisibles à l'œil nu, sont ici euh, ionisés avec un champ magnétique qui nous permet d'un seul coup de les révéler et d'avoir ces différentes couleurs, ces différentes formes. Autour de ce grand disque plat, on a un anneau où les gens sont invités à venir poser leurs coudes et leurs mains sur leurs oreilles et ils vont pouvoir ressentir et entendre une activité de grouillement différent, de différents sons et de différentes vibrations. Et ce sont en fait des traductions de données qui sont captées par différents radiotélescopes qui sont déployés dans le monde et ici qu'on récupère à travers un petit logiciel où on va sonifier ces données pour les, pour les rendre tangibles. Le plasma pulse aussi en même temps à la même activité solaire. En effet, notre étoile active, le Soleil, est aussi une grande boule de plasma. Et donc l'idée, c'était qu'on puisse avoir ces éléments qui pulsent ensemble, comme si ces choses étaient liées par les mêmes forces et les mêmes énergies. So for this project, yeah, the idea was, uh to try and uh, create um, yeah, an observatory in an exhibition space. And uh, here, um, uh, as you said before, I come more from a design background and textiles. And um, I quite enjoy in trying to create uh, my own kind of machines or electronics. So uh, when I st finished uh, my textile design, I started getting really interesting in electronics and this led me to electronic textiles. And, but what really interested me was uh, how all of a sudden you can create your own, um, yeah, your own electronics and circuits and machines, things you do, things that you decide them to do and not the ones that you buy which are already built in and decided by other engineers, um, um, software and, um, and, and, and joining with this, this aspect. And it kind of opened up, I think, a, a way also of saying, okay, we don't need uh, uh, like hard keys to, to enjoy things. How can we, uh, you know, uh, Yeah, think of the world or interact with the world through yeah another way of seeing things, and also coming from a more maybe feminist per perspective, it's also uh, how we can also think of what kind of machines we want in our world, and that we reappropriate also these spaces that are not always very appropriable um, usually. So this gave me a whole yeah, way of thinking, and so many of my um, uh, installations are inspired a lot by the 19th century uh, electronics 
crafts, so I go a lot in these old museums and I look at how people in the 19th century were ma making every single thing from in their lab, in their kitchen, you, not really lab, but kitchen. And uh, so for this project I work, for example, uh, with a scientific glass blower. So here we make these um, glass and then uh, yeah, inserted different kinds of noble gases to make plasma. But here I was trying to, yeah, as I see it as a big instrument or machine. And maybe, I don't know if it's very clear, but the, so the data also is alive. So every 15 minutes I take the last data of the solar activity and it's uh, directly uh, going in the installation. So each time you go in the installation, it will never be the same if there is a, more or less a, you know, the difference of the EMF activity of the sun. Uh, so yeah, I go a lot into trying to mix these crafts of glass, textiles, uh, you know, all these crafts and, and, and blend them in and trying to yeah, make it these kind of sensitive places where we can reflect on, on these things. Um, okay. yeah, so I have uh, maybe, sorry. <laughs> There's a bit of documentation. So also I enjoy yeah, either collaborating with artisans or making things myself, but here are also some of the inspirations. Uh, so these are like the machines we were building to try and understand what was electricity, energy in the time. So we were simulating uh, you know, small uh, lightning strikes. And uh, Gessler, who was a famous, uh, also a scientist, like he, he was a, a craftsman and a scientific. So these also um, yeah, ways of of trying to, these people in the, in the 19th century, which is a period I'm very interested in also for different reasons and archives, <laughs> is also how people would make this experimental science machine where they would try and, uh, s try and see what was happening in this invisible world. So what was in this ether, before we would call it the ether, uh, what was happening in these energies. So it would lead to very interesting uh, experiments like telepathy, using telepathic waves to send information or um, see a uh, ghost and, and, and all these machines are quite interesting in an artistic way because they also reflect on the, yeah, how do we live in these different different realities. Uh, here are the small, if you want to see the Russian lab, so it's also going to Russia and finding uh, a very old, reviving abandoned scientific techniques because these techniques are not used anymore. So going in Russia and finding um, yeah, these teams who, who build up all these uh, their labs and they go and do cruising in the abandoned chemical uh, Russian uh, um, factories to bring back uh, big bottles of, of noble gases. So it's here we're doing the plastic. Here's the lab. Um, what else? <laughs> So yeah, I think uh, just to maybe uh, make the transition, uh, yeah, many of my inspirations also comes from, um, I think, anthropology, uh, where I enjoy also, since I come from textiles, there, there's this way also of how uh, textiles are also this very thin line between a reality and another one. And uh, a lot of my work with the antennas and all these things came a lot with the reflection of um, a certain type of embroidery that is found in the Shibibuku Numbo communities who live in the Amazonian forest. And they, uh, the women uh, embroidery very intricate, very uh, fractal patterns. And uh, what is observed there is that they sing the song, that it is the Ikaro. And while they are singing the song, they both uh, make the same pattern. And they have this way, like uh, not in a Western way we think of notation, but a way which we don't really understand, uh, where they can um, embed these Ikaro songs in their embroideries and in the patterns. And then these embroideries are worn by a shaman, and the shaman will reread these embroideries and re-see them in this in the world, and call the spirits to come and and um, and heal the, the patient that is here in a ceremony. So I think this, for example, is a, an example that really um, like set off a lot of my work because I was like, oh, how can this very thin line of textiles, these little bit of of, of wool and cotton. Uh, suddenly be something that uh, gives us access to the invisible world. And sound also is interesting because even if I, I come from things that are very tangible, sound is a totally intangible. It's an energy and how are these energies going around us? And of course when we put music 
in a concert, all our bodies will start to move and we, we interact in this kind of strange way. So how these vibrations and these movements are, yeah, are things that I think, uh, that are, yeah, that I am interested in. So, yeah. Thank you very much. It's uh, it yes. ex exciting work, and uh, really found very interesting that it all is some sort of the uh, regard, regard back what uh, what was done, and also it's true because if we we'll take 19th century, it's a lot of things was constructed, some kind of the not primitive, but like uh, not really equipped like now laboratory, and so going back uh, to such kinds of the experiments that was done in 19th century. Also, it's like uh, now in 16 middle films that uh, more or less uh, dead, and suddenly a lot of artists start to be interested in the process, and that not only start interested in the process uh, how to fail, but also how to develop. So just uh, there is no anything that disappeared completely, and I think this is very nice thing that is happening uh, between people and between artists because they are more or less some kind of keeping this uh, trace of memory like in your installations. And uh, I would like to <laughs> and I would like to ask uh Paul that oh, Thank you, Alexander, for the invitation, and uh, thank you, Ben and Picasso, for yours. Um, I think from my, I get like the embodiment, the body that will come back. And when I heard you looking back to the historical, I think I'm going more futuristic in the sense that the technologies that I'm working with, uh, of course, there's a long history to it, but uh, I'm mainly using them to, to create or think of um, where they go next, let's say, in the future. Um, so it's about enriching musical interactions. Um, my name is Bavo, I'm a PhD researcher in Ghent University at IPAM, the research team, and I'll briefly give an introduction or an overview of uh, my PhD, of the work that I've been doing. And I start with the two main questions that I'm dealing with. And the first one is uh, about technology to enrich uh, musical interactions, so to think of the potential of technology for this. And a second main question is to improve understanding of musical interaction, so more fundamental uh, on the actual uh, dynamics and, and uh, things happening inside the musical interaction. Um, for these questions, of course, I'm building out uh, the title is not there, but it's fine. Um, it's, it's rooted in two main frameworks. The first one is embodied music cognition. Uh, which views the role of a uh, body as a mediator for meaning form uh, formation. So it talks about how uh, our body influences what we perceive and uh, vice versa. And um, this theory, this theoretical framework also considers uh, the body as a way to access the intentional level of uh, the people we engage with. So if you're involved in a musical interaction, uh, our bodies communicate and give us access also to the intentions of the people that we engage uh, in interaction with. So this is the first the big theoretical framework. We could talk for days about what's inside, but I uh, just wanted to introduce it. A second uh, big framework of theory that I'm using is uh, called coordination dynamics, um, coming from the dynamical systems literature. And um, so my work is also based on or using principles from this uh, theory. Um, which basically uh, talks about how an agent is interacting with the environment. It's about this feedback between action and perception and seeing um, an object of observation, so it can be an interaction between two people, as a closed system in which dynamics are happening, um, in which they execute forces upon each other and getting back uh, information from each other. So having these dynamics closed uh, system out of which um, behavioral dynamics can emerge. So it's uh, also principles of self-organization and uh, leading to um, stable phases, fluctuations, things like that. It's a big fra framework, but um, I hope maybe the examples that I will give sort of will show the, the links to, to the theory behind it. Um, 
So what I, uh, these are two studies that I've did in the past years um, uh, where I'm using uh, extended reality, so uh, extended reality technologies to investigate the dynamics happening inside the musical interaction. Uh, I'll briefly introduce them. Uh, the first one is uh, a piano duet, so two pianists uh, performing the piece Piano Face uh, composed by Steve Reich. Uh, of which one of the pianists is wearing a headset and playing the piece while being immersed in a virtual environment. Uh, the other study is um, um, a percussion uh, duo, so two people trying to drum uh, polyrhythms together while uh, being in an augmented reality environment. I have some material that hopefully can make, will make it less abstract. Uh, but first, so the piano face, uh, piano duo that are playing together and I will just go to the next slide. Uh, basically what we did or what I tried to do was have these two pianists play uh, together in three different conditions. The first one where they are just seeing each other um, as real, so just as a normal thing. They are wearing the headset and I'm using the cameras on the headset so the player of the pianist is the first person view of him, of him or her that is seeing the other pianist and playing the piece uh, like normal, let's say. A second uh, condition is where the other player, he or she is wearing a motion capture suit and controlling a virtual person. So the, uh, the first person view that you're seeing here is seeing the other playing as an avatar, but uh, controlled in real time by a human. And a third condition where there is no other player, it's an algorithmically controlled virtual person. So there's no second real pianist behind it and <coughs> the pianist is playing the piece uh, with uh, a, a virtual agent. And I'll just go back to this slide because I this talk was also a bit about tangibility and tactile things. So I thought this is just a very rude uh, demonstration of me aligning the virtual and the real spaces upon each other. So that could have been interesting. It's, um, of course, when you immerse these people inside the virtual environment, uh, they're wearing the headsets, you have to take very good care on aligning the real and the virtual worlds to each other. As soon as you break uh, this thing, you break the immersed things. So here you see the virtual piano and me doing, you can do this in code, but I'm just doing it with my hands, aligning uh, the two worlds together. And eventually uh, the pianist is getting some virtual hands and the piano, of course, it looks like a real piano with keys moving, but obviously they're just uh, virtual. So. Uh, so that's the first uh, study. The second study that I want to introduce is um, a, a completely different thing, uh, but still an, an interaction between two people. Uh, we did this both in an experimental uh, study as a public uh, performance. Here you see a still from the public performance, and um, it was so. It was two drummers. Um, I have, I think, a better image. Um, this was the view uh, still shown to a uh, live public, live audience, physically present in the space. It's being projected in the back. You see a bit of the audience on the top. Um, and also uh, an online audience uh, witnessing the interaction between the two people, trying to drum uh, these rhythms. You see a video of the two players and a view of how each player is seeing each other. So they are wearing a HoloLens, an augmented reality device, and they see each other as a uh, virtual person, as a hologram in the space, uh, allowing them to interact with each other. They are, uh, yeah, I will show the video after, so they are physically separated. They are not situated in the, real, in the same space. They are in two different buildings and uh, wearing these hololenses, they are capable of interacting with each other in real time. I have a small video, uh, I think. Uh, this is the final part of the performance, uh, so they did this for four minutes trying to drum and at the end um, I also showed to the audience a couple of tweaks, like once you put people inside the virtual environment you can obviously make very easy changes, you can change the perspective uh, of the play of the, of the audience, you can uh, insert uh, animations, agents of earlier recordings so they're playing with each other while playing uh, with other uh, algorithmic control people. Uh, you can change the appearance, and this is really simple. And this one was just a, more of a game that, that we introduced very late, so it's not working very uh, <laughs> smoothly yet. 
but they're playing kind of um, 3D Pong with each other. So you have this virtual ball that is shared. <laughs> Imagine that people are in different buildings, which for us, what was interesting, uh, at the end you see the people really mirroring each other's posture. And I got really the impression that they forgot that this ball obviously does not exist and that they are really separated by 100 meter uh, of each other. The dynamics and the coordination between each other seem very natural and seem very uh, Automatic, and these are, of course, the things that me as a researcher are interesting. I will skip that. Um, this is a very simple picture of actually what I'm trying to investigate. So it's two people that are uh, interacting in a closed loop, and I'm trying to look at the dynamics between these people, the moments of stability, of fluctuation, how they adapt to each other. Um, we all know when we're listening or engaging with music or engaging with each other, you can have these moments of real almost magic yeah, contact with each other where the interaction is not too rigid is also not too fluctuating too chaotic but you get to this sort of flow um, in the interaction and um, i'm interested in the underlying principles that create this kind of smooth um, interaction and to do that uh, we, we record a lot of data so quantitative data of different levels both from the experience the bodily co-regulation co and more the musical uh, data. We record a lot of data and then for these two experiments on the piano face we compare the data across the conditions. So in the first one it's playing with a human, playing with an avatar or playing with an agent. And for the rhythm uh, part it's um, more the realism of the partner that we try to investigate. So it's uh, they played uh, once not seeing each other, once seeing each other as this virtual avatar and once uh, being in the same space, you didn't see this in the video, but they were both just drumming like normal uh, being in the same space. We look at the dynamics uh, that are happening in the data and try to see uh, the causes and, and the hurdles, let's say, to create a good interaction uh, and try to distill patterns uh, from that or principle. Um, so the, this, these studies were mainly dealing with the question of to improve the understanding of a musical interaction but the other sort of line of research in the PhD has been um, on using technology to, and, uh, to uh, increase the expressive potential of, of a person, a musician. Uh, it came forth out of um, our lab. We have a very nice lab there in Ghent with uh, 80 speakers fully uh, surrounding uh, the space. So often when there were people coming into the lab, a composer, an artist, or, or somebody that wants to create, um, you get these 80 speakers, and uh, obviously how do you interact, how do you compose with such a, a, a technologically heavy uh, setup. Um, and so the purpose that I'm trying to do a little bit is um, to think of a new kind of instrument, to think of a new kind of tool to compose in such a space. Uh, building on um, different fields, so uh, from human computer interaction, specialization systems, and, and actual principles of music performance. Think of a new instrument, but um, trying to move away from the really, even though everything that I'm showing is highly technological, but um, we try to move away from the emphasis on this technology and try to complement the design of these instruments. Um, also with artistic and scientific uh, know-how, so to make it more uh, uh, fluent and, and more uh, to increase the expressive potential. Um, this kind of um, uh, study has been done uh, in, in a couple of projects. Uh, one um, where we use an album from Tineke de Meijer and Duncan Spiegman. Uh, they were very generous in giving us their, their audio tracks and, and the poem and we reinterpreted that into a spatial audio uh, composition. Uh, another one, uh, Poem uh, Ingenious by Katrina Portius, also a little bit the same. Uh, I'm going to be just showing this to um, present the way of working in, in, uh, in the lab. Where we start from some poetic material, or start from uh, a basis, interacting and trying to think and work together with uh, the people creating that material. And me as the more engineer technologist that is uh, trying to um, not capture the, the hidden meaning inside these poems, but try to reinterpret or, or uh, add, uh, complement uh, what was in there. Um, and that's also being done in a third project um, led by Shao Calvo. Uh, in our team, 
uh, collaboration with Max Web that is working with um, the imagination, so people, dancers and musicians trying to um, recall their movements and uh, yeah, it's maybe again a bit abstract. But <laughs> um, my approach has been to create this sort of tool, a virtual environment in which uh, people could uh, compose uh, with space. So they listen to the audio or they use the audio fragments and they enter this virtual environment in which they are drawing um, audio trajectories in the space or they are enriching, they're putting expressive uh, velocities on, on existing trajectories or using algorithms uh, like swarms or geometries or um, like ant-like uh, algorithms um, because also in the poem there were like references to swarms or things like that and we tried to use these virtual environments to um, complement and, and aid into the reinterpretation of the, of the piece um, and make it into like I said, this sort of composing with space spatial audio uh, work. Uh, another piece, this was the one with Shavo, um, where we had a dancer in the lab moving on the music and uh, drawing the trajectories while performing sort of on, on the audio. I like this one also because it was a hidden, uh, while testing you get these nice things, because um, the hand tracking, for the hand tracking, he had to keep the hands in front of the headset. <laughs> the, I really like the choreography where the hands always had to stay in front of the face. It was a technological constraint, but actually leading to, in my view, some beautiful uh, things. Uh, besides um, the creation and composition um, of these things, of these, um, using these technologies to, to compose uh, music, uh, we also think about uh, the presentation because not everybody has a lab uh, like that or a speaker set up like that. Um, so this is just a small illustration of this first piece, the Being Hungry, um, that we presented in Mozilla Hubs, an online environment where we um, reduce the spatial recording to just a binaural stereo recording in which you could walk around and we experience this just a small uh, demo of uh, how you would see the piece. Like, this is how the piece would have looked if you would enter in a lab. Uh, you could, while wearing, being at home wearing a headphone, you could get sort of the sense of uh, how the experience in the lab uh, would have been. So we are also trying to think on how can you present and share uh, these uh, new um, ways of taking a piece, of reinterpreting a piece, uh, essentially. Um, yeah. I'm a bit hesitant to show the last slide. I was thinking, like, how can I maybe also provoke some questions uh, here? Um, and this, these are just like some dualistic terms, but um, basically my work, personally, what I like the most is to really work on the boundary um, of, of uh, things, so the real and the virtual, the tangible, the intangible. Uh, I put like some heavy words on there, but uh, they're just examples of how I um, am more interested, not so much in one or the other, but really the oscillations between the two and the friction sometimes between the two, because they, they can, yeah, for me personally, uh, give some interesting uh, yeah, work, let's say. Okay, so that was my presentation. <laughs> It's, it's very interesting to have all these three very different approach for the between uh, uh, artists and researchers. So and, uh, for me, it's um, I would like also, for example, to ask uh, Enrico when you start create uh, your piece that we've seen you performing. So the, your main idea was to make it tangible, yes, but. Uh, how you, you more or less just uh, you also worked on the programming behind it. So how works it is it between development of this piece, uh, make it tangible, and also programming the sound and how to develop it just uh, how it was working for you for the phones. Yeah, obviously. I mean, I, I, uh, I mean, I could have done the same with a lot of failures and knobs, no. <laughs> but the thing is, it was a. Uh, uh, I needed to, to, to create a space where I could just explore materiality 
and then that had a, have a connection with, with, the, with the programming. With, there is a lot of programming underneath, actually. It's a lot of machine learning, and sound synthesis, etc., etc. And you see it all in there in the laptop, so I can show the patches and everything. But the, the important thing is that, um, I don't know, when I'm, perf I'm performing, uh, people don't, don't look at the, at the computer, but they look at the action, the sound, uh, as if it was a, I don't know, a cello. And for me, that's the, the big message that, uh, well, obviously there is something there with technology probably, because they hear things that are not usually happening when you touch a paper, so to say. But, uh, but at the end, uh, I want to normalize the situation between a digital instrument and the audience and myself, you know, where I access a digital programming, a lot of digital programming in different frameworks, but in, in, the, in the traditional way. Because if you see, everyone can, you know, knows how to touch a, a drum set. You know? It's just like that. Obviously, if you learn and then you study and then you continue, then you can access more stuff for the drum set or from you know, any other instrument. So then this, I want to provoke the kind of you know, exploration to the materiality, and then obviously this is all connected to the, to the computer and the digital, digital, digital uh, program that is in there. But it's also very interesting because it's you walking to the light when you play, when you perform it. And times, and uh, normally if you play in, I don't know, violent or piano, this is, well, that you see keys, just we, they are not disappearing. But your light, it's a, you have really the impression that the light gives you rhythm how to work on this. Uh, I mean, in, in the pieces where it's all made of wood, there is it's mostly uh, a kind of blind exploration. So yeah, I often close my eyes and then I leave myself. Also people, because I don't know, they don't look at the instrument anymore. I mean, there, there's, a, there's an interesting thing that is like, um, when you approach a material, they, then, then you, you, you see it from the distance, and then you, you first, it's a visual, uh, visual object, right? And then, then you have an expectation of, you know, what, what is gonna happen when you touch it. Then when you touch it, then you become, you put your, 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 your eyes in, the, in your fingers, so to say, you know, that there is a, a kind of intimate relationship, but you're also reading and, 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 and seeing the material with the kind of action and perception you know, that's very much into embodied music cognition and so on. So it's basically uh, uh, the, the modalities of exploring the materiality changes a lot when you, you are able to touch and to explore it from, from different distances. Mm -hmm. And I think that basically uh, this is the, the point that yeah, when we are able to touch, then we are also having the same perception and action in the loop, but in a, you know, in a, in a for me it's the perfect sense. And this is why I'm, I'm, I'm exploring it. Mm -hmm. And, That's question. Yes. Um, I've seen you performing on Sunday was really impressive, uh, uh, um, but I, I didn't see the, uh, from where I was at the point of view, I didn't see that indeed uh, the, the screen was covered with something which was engraved in, 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 in the uh, relief, yeah. um, and I didn't see the relationship between this uh, engraved annotation and, and your, your play. How do you translate uh, uh, the gesture that you have on this engraving through the computer system. Do, do you measure it with some techniques, and then there is an algorithm? Um, yeah, let me let me just explain it in, in a minute. So basically, the you have the possibility of uh, analyzing a database of sounds. Then you have sound files in your computer, and then you chop them in small grains, in like something like twenty milliseconds grains, and then you have a lot of grains, right? And then for each of these grains, you, you run an analysis, uh, extracting something like 40 characteristics from each of these grains, like informing you about the amplitude, for example, the volume, but also the, 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 the spectral profile, the noisiness, the roughness, many things. No? And then you, you create a database of, for each of these ground, grains, then you have 40 characteristics. Okay? And then uh, in real time, what I'm doing is the same analysis, I chop the sound I create on the on the surfaces, and then the algorithm tries to find the grain in the database which matches 
Better? That one that I'm playing live. And then resynthesizes sound, taking sounds from the database. Okay? So input and output is, is completely decoupled, is separated, but then it's driven by my activity. And just for finalizing, the thing is that you could you could actually synthesize sound with with a symbolic machine, right? That you say, go with a cursor and then find, you know, do this and that and that. But uh, but if you do that, it's quite deterministic, right? You at the end you have a you don't have a the decision to to to, to somehow create things that you don't know. When I'm when I'm accessing the algorithm, I do it with you know the noisiness of my fingers and without knowing which grain I'm gonna play. So I could have used a, a cursor to find you know to play noises and sounds, but I want to make it without deciding, and that's what for me. The interesting thing when you approach the, the computer without means to, to be deterministic. Okay, so that's not deterministic, and then you and then you learn to, to play with it, yeah. uh, like and to master system. it. So. Okay, yeah. yeah. I like that. Um, uh, I wouldn't have liked to see the patch, <laughs> <I> can see. <laughs> so that might be a personal thing for me. I have to think of also, also in the classical console, you also have the people that are setting as as they want to the um, what's happening. Um, seeing the expression in the movements is something else, and seeing the analytical uh, things inside. Eh? When you look at the piano being played, the expression of the penis are interesting, the hammer sticking the chords for me. That's all. Uh, so I like that it's, it was uh, not yeah, sure. This, this would be an optional story for you. Maybe you recreate that there. I have questions for you. <laughs> yeah. That is, if you have tried to do the same experience of the piano, but without an instrument which is discretized, you know? what happens if you do it in a violin, for example, which is more continuous, it's still discretized somehow. There is a string and it sounds only there. But at least this continues. And, and I don't know, because I think the the, the issue of discretizing music and, 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 and the, the parameters of music also affects the system. No? But what happens if you have a drum set, for example, no? ritual drum set? No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, here for this specific piece, obviously, um, we wanted to rely on the expertise of the pianists. They were professional pianists playing and uh, performing piano with So the alignment of the keys was very crucial, which wasn't perfect. And so um, most of them I was looking at they were so good that they didn't have to look at the keys. Yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it opened up things. Attaching like a physical to the virtual, uh, putting a virtual thing on top uh, is, is a very interesting aspect because of um, you, you're trying to extend uh, uh, to new instruments. Um, in this study, it was more like replicating what's already there, replicating uh, things that are already happening. Um, so no, I haven't tried it yet, but uh, yeah. in the future. Well, of course, you have the space alignment uh, between the avatar or the virtual and uh, the real person. But what about the time alignment? Because uh, uh, if, you play, if you take Very this good. piece of Steve Rage, Faith, it's yeah. so much complicated. Yeah, and yeah. if you, you see the delay that you have in uh, uh, all this uh, digital system, uh, and the time lag that you have, yeah. how do you cope with that? It's a very good question because um, with all these mediated uh, things, and I guess Enrico also, you will always have a latency. Yes. You always have, yes. and with machine learning, it, you need to do it fast enough. And it's never instant. Even the sound of your voice reaching no. me is not even instant. But uh, with all these layers of high technology become slower. Concretely, here the latencies were um, <coughs> controlled well enough to facilitate real-time interaction, so visually, uh, auditory, it was all okay. For the agent, um, that was a dynamic algorithm, uh, a model that adapts the face um, in a dynamic way, like an oscillator, um, uh, not following, because you can do tempo tracking and all these things, but the agent, the algorithmically controlled agent, was adapting its face uh, adaptively uh, based on the score to the real-time playing of the pianist because the pianist as a human is, is speeding up, slowing down sometimes and in this piece, this is also why we chose that piece, the notes are, the pattern is always re repeated 
So it allowed us to just focus on, on tracking uh, the face uh, using that algorithm. Um, and it worked very well. Like in, in time um, base, it was very good because the task was constrained and the algorithm for tracking. Um, also the result from this first study, what did it work well was the co-regulation with the agent. Uh, and this is maybe an obvious result, but uh, even frust it was so strong that the frustration from the pianist uh, that you're interacting with an agent and it was a pre-recording, so head nodding and communicative uh, movements between the players was really not uh, aligned. So uh, obviously in a real performance you have surprises, you have things happening that you sort of expect of your partner to, to happen at a certain point. And because we were using a, a recording that was just sped up, slowed down, so um, in terms of movement it was not good. In terms of music and face it was really uh, well done using these algorithms, so let's say. Yeah. I don't know if it answers your question, but it's all sort right. Of okay. Claire, and I have also a question for you, because uh, you also, for example, this uh, sound piece that you show us, Zoya, but you make another sound piece when, for example, you are trying to read some kind of the, uh, what is happening in a space and just uh, not in the space, I mean in, in, the, in the space like now, now here, and after to interpret and you know, to construct in some kinds of the, um, more or less, uh, like you say, just uh, do yourself uh, utilities just to interpret it. And did you, uh, did, did you already try to do it with the, um, with the women? With the women? Yes, with women. Women on facilities like just the, the we were just like you used to in your installation with the meat. Uh, uh, with the weaving. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I tried to use a weaving machine to weave the. So, yeah, so this installation was using a knitting machine. So, a knitting machine is one thread that loops, and there is a technique to make pattern which we call a jacquard. I make your chandras with patterns. So this installation was a, it's an old one, and it's 2012. Um, and here I was, uh, so usually when we ask people for an exhibition to do a piece, then I, I have my antennas and I go and scan around the space. And then I record the memory of the space. So I'm recording with the antennas, not the sound, but the electromagnetic activity. So you have to imagine in every, cable, every electronics has a kind of uh, aura <laughs> uh, coming through, or yeah, you have radios, except like I said at the beginning. And so here I will record and it's, uh, yeah, and then I will put it in the knitting machine and it will record, of course, uh, in a very, uh, <laughs> very small resolution. So if you compare like a knitting point to uh, today, a USB key, it's, uh, you know, a very small portion of this of this, but it's the idea of having like memory coded, and it was inspired by um, the fact that every sound we produce uh, leaves a trace in the matter. So uh, there were I read a, a really interesting article where they were saying, for example, in the very well protected uh, caves, uh, if when you could uh, have the sound of uh, people who were inside, uh, you know, thousands. <laughs> thousands of years ago or activity which was inside because every single sun we provoke there's a vibration and it's like a, yeah it stays inside the matter but we don't have the technology to see for now as small as that but we could reread like the walls and the architecture from from this so yeah this is how I was inspired for uh, these pieces um, yeah so really kind of like a memorial <laughs> yeah because this is a really amazing piece just that I found it really very impressive. You told it it's not new one, but it was like in 2015 or something like this. But I, I found it very interesting how you how you made this approach between uh, again old technique and new technique. It's always something in between uh, some kind of the invention that is uh, rather now and not something that you used that already existed for a thousand years. Well, actually, well, also the, a lot of the work there at the time was uh, trying to understand because I was hacking my knitting machines and connecting computers to them and saying, okay, what do computers and knitting machines have to say to each other if you exclude the human? And a lot of the work was um, 
was trying to find the common language because we can translate many things, but if you want to translate something, of course you're going to lose some information, you're going to gain another one, but you try to find a language in which it's interesting, otherwise it doesn't mean much. And so it was a whole research where, uh, where the weaving looms for this technique, the jacquard, were uh, um, inspired to our, mod like our modern computers through the binary codes, and it was Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage who were working on the analytical engine, so the first like big uh, calculate, uh, calculation machine. Uh, and they saw the, the, the Jacquard card, so it's these um, cards, punched cards, whole punched whole cards, where you, they would, uh, the patterns of the weaving uh, looms would be encoded, and they said, ah, wow, this is interesting, this is with this binary system, we could create a, like a co computational system. And actually what's interesting is that Basile Bouchon, who, um, who invented these, uh, the first punch hole cards, his father was an uh, org, um, of your Bavari. Yeah, when you, the, <laughs> the virtual card where you play with them. And so it's interesting how this language of sound then gave uh, these textiles and these textiles gave computers. And so when you put uh, sound into a knitting machine, these zero and ones are quite, uh, I mean, they're very logic in a way. I mean, there is this co the common ADN inside. So it's always, I think, in the research, yeah, trying to find something where things can connect otherwise, yeah and what they can say to each other. <laughs> yeah, because I, I like this piece very much, as so uh, your recent piece, uh, Zoria. Uh, and Zoria, this is uh, coming from the, uh, the ideas, uh, the gardens of the, of the uh, some kinds of Slovenian gardens? Um, yes, uh, it was in honor of R Russia where uh, <laughs> it was born, <laughs> partly born. Uh, yeah, it's Zoria is the um, the guardians of the auroras, and they are the the daughters of the sun, auroras borealis. And yes, so that's why I named it. Uh, <laughs> and also, just for example, I, look, I know that you have a lot of questions, but like uh, that's also is very interesting that uh, I like. Uh, well, just I have a question. For example, now in um, your set with the pianist. So the pianists, they had wheel, clavier, and they have this virtual one. And uh, did they try to play only a virtual one? Uh, no. <laughs> Again, I should try more, eh? already two suggestions, but uh, no, no, no. I, I can imagine. Yeah, it would be interesting. Yes, it's extremely interesting because this is uh, normally that, like you told, this is professional pianists, they know exactly, well, just uh, they know very well all these careers. And, mm -hmm. But if it's virtual, so. so it's yeah, 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 and position of the keys for me, I, I am, when I'm like in the train and I play some amateur piano, I cannot do it uh, on the table. I need the feedback yeah. from the piano, both sound as tactile, like a keeping. If I try to do it on the train, if I'm practicing or whatever, I cannot do it. Well, an expert pianist, um, I've seen them do it, uh, just uh, practicing on the surface. Uh, they don't really need even the, because the motor programs uh, are so trained. Um, so yeah, again, it would be very interesting, I think, to do, but... Uh, well, because I'm thinking that uh, maybe in the future we'll have a totally virtual environment, so just that people will be in this environment that we can imagine, yeah. that they will be sleeping or just to, to be in some kind of special state, <laughs> and it's really <laughs> nice well, to, to... And already it's not so... F like I've seen recently, uh, and again, the company, I will not name it here, let's not break them in a small space, but um, like a wristband, they bought a company with EMG and just using, because there are so many nerves in the wrist, that uh, just using that wristband you can control a virtual hand or they connect it to a robot and uh, just by using the nerves that are here, the signals that, that you send, um, it's able to connect so you don't even need, and they obviously bought this company to move away from the keyboard and the mouse that we all use for already quite some time. Um, yeah, I will, I, this tactility uh, will be missed, I think. Eh? Uh, <laughs> I think everyone from now cannot imagine. I think there's more yeah, to say about that. But uh, uh, as you said, the, the body in interaction is so much important. If you play keyboard, uh, you have all the physical aspect of the, the touch pressure, the force, the velocity. Uh, if you 
Well, as long as you don't uh, simulate that, you will have a different music. Yeah, yeah. At least a different expression uh, yeah. to it. Yeah. I'm just saying uh, what I find interesting also is how we're tending to go in more and more invisible, where we're going into all these different realities without even knowing, and but behind all these systems are very heavy. So it's also how all these machines are heating up and you know producing a lot of energy to give uh, another one. It's also interesting how yeah we're like when everything is like yeah at the end technology will maybe be a powder or like makeup or something, and it's but all the systems also are, are still here. There is infrastructure. We talk a lot about the clouds. And yeah, I think it's also uh, all these. Uh, <laughs> so. yeah, I wanted to ask you uh, actually about the invisible, because but not uh, because um, there there is the invisible and the unknown, so to say, right? Because maybe it's also about that, like perceive also in your work, you know, that the computers do not know anything about the unknown. They can perceive things which are invisible, but. There are things which are invisible and also unknown, you know? and this is the where we work you know, as artists. You know? And I wanted to to ask you about that also in the in the, um, in the sense of how you explore uh, techniques which uh, appear in the 19th century, mm -hmm. where still or technology or technological developments were still quite connected with with other fields like religion, right, or other types of ways of knowing, right, uh, which were still present, you know, because um, now in career, you basically you kind of embed so to say, the program in religion or other, other ways of knowing, you know? and I think when you are talking about, uh, I don't remember whether those uh, embroideries or garments in Amazonas, technology, religion, myth, um, uh, cultural uh, development, it's all one, right, but we are here splitting the things we are doing in many, so to say, uh, departments. No? And I wanted to ask you about uh, how you approach that, actually. No? Well, actually, the, the, uh, so in the 19th century, you have to imagine there was the first communication, so the first electrical telegraph. And so with the first time, the people could communicate with somebody disembodied, which is today very normal. So we navigate in all these systems where we talk to each other you know, through the ether and all our or phantom identities are scrolling through the air, but it was at the time, and for yeah, good reason, very, very obscure. And you know, what is this new world? You know, and what are we doing? This invisible today? Yeah, nobody really thinks about it. I mean, not so many people. But <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but uh, what's interesting also is a lot of our technology today has been shaped by uh, the ambitions there. So there is Edison who uh, had the whole. Um, the schematics, and he was trying to make a machine to talk to the dead, for example. And the phonograph uh, was inspired by this. Or Alexander Bell, who had lost his brother, and he was also trying to make a communication system because it was also the beginning of all the spiritualist uh, religions. So the spiritualists was where these people would come around and do a science, and these women mediums who would imitate with their body the telegraphs would try and communicate with the dead, and there was all this no fluid energy, electricity going through. So they would construct these machines to try and understand what was happening. What's interesting is there's a lot of occult, I think much more than we think, in our in our technology. And also if you think of of today what we have, the heritage of these sixties of psychedelic, a lot of drugs, a lot of trying to go in different realities who are who make all this Silicon Valley. Also I think there are things that are much less uh, you know uh, objective than what the uh, yeah uh, the, uh, sci the science of the big S has, is trying to push. And yeah, I don't really believe in it. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's much more uh, porous. And, um, and when you travel and you see how people use electronics, for example, and also I find it very interesting where all of a sudden, yeah, people use electronics to make something else. I mean, in India, you have the electronic telephones to talk to God, and, and this is embedded in the culture. It's not a problem. Or, yeah, in Japan, where you have uh, all this uh, no problem of having cyborgs, relationships, or, or being in I mean, all this is kind of a cult. And I think uh, this is all the interesting thing of this kind of collective hallucination maybe we're living in. I don't know. That's why I'm saying all these invisible things, and they're very heavy systems, so I don't know. Maybe these questions. 
I chose it. Would you say that, that it's um, a bit loss of the awareness of this hallucination? Because when you described talking to ghosts, it was seen as obscure and in the beginning seemed like a big thing, and rightly so. But right now that I'm having so many identities floating around, and you, it's amazing to see these new people, people that never had a VR set or this hologram. When it's VR, it's quite impressive. Uh, they are always a bit shocked and you have to adapt, getting in and getting out. With AR, uh, that you have a hologram suddenly standing, and I've done this with 40 people, they adapt so quickly. Was my mother, she was immediately pushing buttons in the air, and uh, the obscure, the weirdness of it uh, was not uh, triggered. There's a bit of a wow effect, but it's more like a gimmick or a sensational effect, you know, not what, what's actually happening. Uh, would you say that it's uh, like moving towards, uh, we forget a bit that, uh, this unknown or this invisible and the impact that technology uh, has related to that? Yeah, I mean, it's we're construction realities all the time, you know? I mean, the world we live in, the way we interact with things, the images we have, all, I mean, so I think we're just, there are a lot of realities in which we, we go and not go, and people who have access to different realities than us, I mean, uh, like for example, we're working now for an exhibition uh, on the communities of shifters who are uh, teenager girls who do astral travels uh, and they make apps in their astral travels uh, and they activate them and they are already just where their body creating worlds in which they go in which looks like video games. So it's always, I don't know, I think it's, it's hard because it, yeah, people, some people can you know, manage to access to these uh, different realities with with the very uh, yeah, um, uh, low-tech things and these high-tech, I don't know. I think as humans, we're, we're a bit, bit strange anyway, no? <laughs> okay. I don't have the answer. Mm, do you have some questions? Humans are strange. Well, because they are very different, it means that just uh, we never know what even uh, somebody sitting near you thinking and uh, what to, to know what it's people like two kilometers from here thinking it's really not possible. But we hope that we probably will be able in some moment just to read some kind of their brain waves, just there is a lot of research about it. Maybe uh, totally in the sense of their words, but at least some sort of the information like uh, sensation. So, but still, I don't, I'm not sure that we will answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so I think that thank you very much uh, for to be present here with us uh, and to, to take part in the lazy talk. And uh, I hope that. Um, our spectators who was following us on the YouTube uh, so enjoy. Sorry, we didn't uh, take questions this time, but uh, if you will have, so you can always write, and uh, we will try to follow. And uh, thank you very much for Nadine who uh, hosted us, and uh, Imal who initiated this year this uh, talk. And we'll see next uh, June 12th. Yes, yes and next uh, uh, laser talk will be in a mile on the 12th of June. And uh, it will be uh, devoted to the olfactory. So just uh, the sensation of uh, how we feel things, but how we smell them. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you.